Good morning, everybody. My name is Gail Cartmail. I'm Assistant General Secretary for Unite the Union, and it's my great honour to be this year's TUC president. And I'm going to be chairing today's webinar, The Rise of the Far Right, Building a Trade Union Response. And I just want to say that I'm going to go into some housekeeping, but before I do, um, we have a phenomenal uh, range of participants and I can see the numbers rising on the screen. So um, you are all very, very welcome indeed. So um, just a few housekeeping um, points. Um, can uh, all participants please post uh, any questions that you want to raise on the Q&A? Um, that'd be great. Um, we're really keen um, to tease out those questions. And if we don't get round to them today, they'll form a part of uh, the thinking going forward. Um, so uh, it's also important that you know this is a public event and we're being recorded. So bear that in mind. Um, and the recording may go on YouTube. Just one final point um, um, on that type of thing. Um, do please look at the chat because we plan to post on chat details of forthcoming events, really important stuff. I think you'll be interested in um, training opportunities coming up in the new year. So keep an eye out for those. Um, there will be uh, posted on the chat for everybody to see um, the code of conduct. So the TUC's committed to organizing activities at which everybody can participate in an exclusive, inclusive, uh, respectful and safe environment. And the statement goes on um, to spell out what that means. So this is um, an event organized by the TUC and you will understand, of course, um, as a movement, we want to maintain the highest standards of respect um, uh, in all of this type of event. So, I, I'm, I'm just going to introduce this really important um, event. It's the launch of a new TUC report, The Rise of the Far Right, Building a Trade Union Response. And it's been produced by Trademark in Belfast. And what we know is that the uh, right wing popular populist movements um, have gained electorally and their messages have found their way into the mainstream. And their at narratives are aimed at working people. But importantly, um, today we'll acknowledge that the rise of the far right is an international phenomenon um, and that that requires a joined up response. Um, so today's launch will explore how the trade union movement is responding and what we can do to work together internationally to build solidarity against those who are trying to divide us. Um, the report includes several recommendations uh, for action and importantly, building on what trade unions are already doing. And it's a part of the TUC strategy to build a coherent response based on our values of internationalism. There are a series of workshops being planned um, for the new year including exchanges with sister unions internationally. And as I've said earlier, there'll be details of the training sessions taking place next uh, year um, posted uh, in chat. Um, we're going to have uh, uh, contributions from a range of people. Um, I'll introduce each properly as we get to them. Um, but just to give you a flavour, uh, uh, we've got um, Dr. Stefan O'Newlan um, from Trademark Belfast, Kevin Courtney, um, who's a TUC General Counsel International Spokesperson and the NEU Joint General Secretary, um, Kevin the Spokesperson for International, uh, international Issues, Chidi King, who's the Director of Equality, International Trade Union Confederation, the ITUC, and of course our very own Francis O'Grady, General Secretary of the TUC. I'll um, introduce them all again when we come to them. Um, so that's my introduction. Um, 
I hope that uh, we've got the majority of participants joined now. Um, and uh, I'm keen to get on with it because um, we want some time for Q&A. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Stefan O'Newlan uh, o um, from Trademark Belfast. Um, Trademark uh, is a fantastically interesting organization. It's the anti-sectarian and anti-racist unit of the uh, Irish Congress of Trade Unions, the ICTU, um, and has long been at the forefront of providing trade union based response to the challenges of racism, sectarianism, and the legacy of the troubles in Ireland. And it was um, the TUC, of course, uh, commissioned Trademark um, to research and write this report. Um, Stefan, you're very welcome indeed. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much, Gail. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Comrades, uh, pleasure to be here. Great turnout, uh, even though it is online. We're very pleased to have been involved in, uh, in what is a genuinely collaborative piece of work with the Equalities and International Teams uh, in the TUC. Work that we all took very seriously, of course, because it's, it's a very serious subject. Um, it's a robust piece of work, we think. It covers a lot of ground and we, we generally hope it will be a useful resource for all of our members interested in learning about uh, the rise of the right. And we genuinely hope as well that it assists in us building strategies to combat what is a genuine threat. Um, the resurgence of the far right is probably one of the standout features of contemporary politics, uh, particularly over the last 10 years, and particularly since, of course, the 2008 global financial crisis, uh, which saw an equivalent of something in the region of 50% of global GDP or $40 trillion mobilized to bail out a failed financial system. No equivalent mobilization, of course, took place to bail out workers and communities. And in fact, we were made to pay for the most of it through brutal austerity regime and, of course, a subsequent collapse in living standards. These structural and economic factors are of particular relevance uh, to a trade union understanding of the far right's re-emergence, of course, um, particularly over the last 10 years, as I said. And, and economically speaking, we've kind of entered a new normal uh, that's characterised, of course, by precarious work, global financial instability, degraded public infrastructure and utilities, renewed attacks upon trade unions globally, radical levels of inequality that we've never seen before, and also suffocating levels of debt, and not just personal debt that we carry, but also the, the kind of elephant in the room of economics, global private sector debt. Um, and all of this, of course, has fueled understandably widespread anger and a kind of anti-establishment and even anti-politics sentiment amongst uh, many people, which the right in particular has utilised to, to a great effect. And so subsequently, we've seen an increase in the far right uh, in parliaments. In Europe, it's gone from 2% in the 1980s to 14, 15% today. We've seen the, their presence on the streets increase and the birth of a global online movement, which I'm going to talk about briefly. Um, a kind of new social media ecosystem has emerged with new narratives and new ideas that have accompanied that. And whilst there's kind of huge diversity on that right, because it's such a global phenomenon, there's one thing that kind of links all of the groups and all of the movements and all of the parties that we bring under that term. And it's a shared emphasis on ethnic or cultural superiority and nostalgia for this kind of imagined past that's of course never actually existed. And of course, the ideology of racial superiority is still very much with us, particularly amongst uh, white supremacists and Nazis. Uh, but increasingly the far right has come to espouse what we can understand or what's being called at least uh, nativism or ethnic nationalism, which kind of strongly opposes immigration or changes to the national character, whatever that may be, uh, which strongly defines outsiders as other and not part of us, even though the us is vaguely defined, but often just means white. Um, and of course, these ideas don't just exist in a vacuum. That's the important bit. They've been boosted significantly, uh, we would argue, by a process of mainstreaming which has had the effect of legitimizing and normalizing far-right parties, their ideas and their values, to the extent that it's become, they have become acceptable as political vehicles, they've become acceptable as coalition partners, and the cordon sanitaire around far-right parties has been broken through. Uh, and they have a, a great ability now to influence government policy on questions of immigration and welfare and minority rights and so on. And obviously the role of the mainstream media in that process uh, is of serious concern most obviously with the growth of, of really powerful corporate media outlets uh, that sympathize, sympathize with or indeed openly promote radical right-wing agendas. Uh, the latest wave uh, of far-right growth um, can be explained partly by their influence, but not just by them alone, because um, we need to make reference to another phenomenon. If we'd have written this report or something similar 10 years ago, 
the section on online organizing wouldn't be in it because it's new uh, and it's also proved itself to be very effective uh, in spreading ideas and indeed recruiting people to the far right. The ascendance, if you like, of alternative right wing media outlets, particularly on social media and the internet and, and, and online forums has had and it is having a disproportionate effect on wider political debate in the mainstream. It kind of acts as a conveyor belt almost, bringing ideas and political projects that are manufactured by radical right wing kind of digital media into the public domain. And of course, we've seen a rapid, huge proliferation of these online content creators on the right, their networks, their groups, their subcultures, which are proven to be uh, increasingly sophisticated, disciplined, and effective processes of radicalization. They really do create effective radicalization pathways, rabbit holes, if you like, down which people can and do fall. And when they come up the other side, they're often militant far right activists who don't sit in their rooms tapping away on their keys, but increasingly carry these ideologies uh, and uh, narratives into the real world and into workplaces. Um, so whereas the right wing media, the mass media can, can impact public discourse and broadly shift the idea of what's politically acceptable. And we've seen that and there's evidence of that. The online pathways that individuals follow do create dangerous far right militants. And these two dynamics working together is a, is a very dangerous recipe. And the report goes into that in some detail. The online phenomenon too is a key factor, of course, in the internationalization of the far right, which is again part of this uh, phenomenon. I've not really seen it like that since the 1930s in terms of its mobilization, their shared narratives, shared ideology, their targets, their organizational networks, uh, how they communicate, and of course the financing, um, which is a particularly dark area that needs even more light shone on it um, from this point on, I think. We make some reference to that in the, in the report. Um, and as part of that global phenomenon, um, the far right, of course, has also taken power at the national level in many governments. And I know that Kevin's going to talk more of that next. But what this tells us and what we can begin to understand from the process uh, is that these are kind of variants of a wider phenomenon, in fact, that sees a convergence, a kind of historical convergence we haven't seen before between the neoliberal economic model, failing as it is, um, combined with increasing authoritarianism from the state, whether that's surveillance or the paramilitarization of police forces and so on. And of course, the accompanied by far right rhetoric and the targeting of minorities, whether black communities, ethnic groups, LBG, LGBTQ women and so on. Um, but of course, it's important to say with all that said, that it's not a foregone conclusion that the right's gonna win. And that's, that's really important to say, I think. Um, a lot depends on us. A lot depends on the response of the labor movement uh, in Britain and Ireland internationally. Uh, on the social movements that we're part of and of course related political parties and the report does speak to some of those successful campaigns particularly in Latin America but also it makes reference to some of the really excellent work being undertaken by unions uh, in Britain particularly Unite we mentioned the FPU the NEU of course there are others of course can't name them all um, but we can build on that work and that's I mean none you know enough is never enough in when you're fighting the far right and in terms of what we need to do uh, as a labor movement it's crucial that as the coming economic crisis hits, and it will, uh, we continue to build workers' power, of course. We need to build strong global relationships and build those relationships, particularly with unions who face direct repression and authoritarian practices. Uh, we seriously need to look at the role of social media, of course. I know that everyone is, but we need to get our voice in there too. Uh, big tech companies amplify these narratives of the far right, and we need to assist uh, those who are mapping the influence of far right networks online as well, so that we can kind of de design and identify strategies that will pull people away from the influence of the far right and remind them that their interests are the same as the people working and living next to them, regardless of the color of their skin or their identities. Um, above all, I think raising political awareness amongst workers and communities must be a priority for the labor movement here and internationally. Um, we need to build a kind of compelling, compelling narrative and a realistic vision to counter those of the far right and sustained political education um, amongst representatives, activists, members, communities must be at the top of our list of priorities. I mean, combating the far right is a, is a political question and it requires, of course, a political answer. That's easier said than done, of course. Um, just as the far right has grown in, absence of, in an absence of, of progressive alternatives in some areas, to the an, an alternative to the obvious failures of neoliberalism. We need to start talking about and building those alternatives. And of course, winning people to our vision of a transformative and sustainable economy. 
um, particularly not just in the face of the economic, multiple economic crises we face, but of course, in the face of climate breakdown. I'll finish on this last point. Um, the far right doesn't like us. I don't need to tell you that. <laughs> uh, it doesn't like organized workers. Um, it doesn't like our unity. Um, but we're here today to remind them, as we do every day, that they shall not pass. Uh, I'll finish with a quote from Daniel Singer, which kind of sums up the talk. I could have just given this quote and walked away. Um, if the left fails to provide rational progressive solutions to the growing social and economic crises, the right will seize the occasion with irrational and reactionary solution to those crises. I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. It's a fantastic start uh, to our webinar. And um, welcome to all the participants. And just to remind you, please, to post your questions uh, on the Q&A and they're coming in. I'm warning the panel, we've got some excellent questions um, that will be put to you if we uh, can um, just keep mind mindful of the time. So I'm now going to introduce um, uh, our brilliant colleague, Kevin Courtney, I've already mentioned. He's the General Counsel International Spokesperson. He's also the Joint um, General Secretary of his union, the NEU. What Kevin brings to this um, are two key attributes to tackling the far right. One is knowledge. And, you know, to be honest, he's one of the most knowledgeable people I know about the rise of the far right globally, um, but also passion. Um, you're very welcome, Kevin. Well, thanks very much, Gail. Um, that's too good a, a, an introduction. This report really matters because the rise of the far right isn't just theoretical and it's vital how we plan, how we respond in the UK context. But it's also vital that we see the international dimensions and see the successes and failures. And as Stevens just said, the past couple of decades has seen a growing internationalization of the far right, a mobilization. They have shared narratives, shared targets, strategies. They have shared organizational networks and financing. It is a global phenomenon and we need an international response to it. So, the far right parties have now gained ground in parallel with the mobilization of right wing extremists on the streets. These parties, among them properly fascist parties, are the second or third strongest electoral forces in many European countries. They've actually taken power at a national level in several countries, Hungary, Poland, Turkey, Brazil, Colombia are just some examples. And in all of these examples, and Stephen mentioned this as well, we see a convergence between neoliberalism, far-right rhetoric, and increasing authoritarianism. And these governments have an anti-labor movement, anti-workers' rights theme that's central to them. So with that convergence, it's unsurprising that the, the countries I just mentioned are on the ITUC's top 10 list of countries which are the worst in the world for workers' rights and where we see increasing repression of trades unionists and human rights. Look at Hungary, where over the past decade, the Orban regime has followed a neoliberal path and an austerity program that has legislation that curtails the right of workers and trades unions. Collective bargaining provisions and the right to strike being really diminished, while in 2019, they introduced a slave law, that it's called in, that, in, in Hungary, that allows companies to demand 400 hours of overtime per year. The government has instituted a punitive workfare state where the unemployed, disproportionately, of course, Roma and Sinti, are forced to carry out hard labour, often under police supervision. You see some of these things starting to develop in our country, but these countries are so much further ahead. In both Hungary and Poland, anti-immigrant policies and rhetoric closely linked with a renewal of radical conservatism and an escalation in culture wars. That's involved the insertion of religious rhetoric and practices into all aspects of public life. In Hungary, the government has banned the teaching of gender and feminist studies in universities. In Poland, the state has promoted anti-LGBT rhetoric, introduced an effective ban on abortion, stimulating huge protests. You look at Turkey, the government there has increasingly relied on authoritarian, repressive, violent modes of governance. Our brothers and sisters there have seen the, the, the use of violent security policies against the political opposition and against trades unions. They've seen mass detention, arrest, imprisonment under a prolonged state of emergency, media censorship, restrictions on the freedom of assembly. 
they've seen the government dissolve the, its resolution process for a negotiated settlement to the Kurdish question and instead launch a military offensive against the, K, the PKK in the, Turkish, in the Kurdish region. It's brought the AK, AKP, the governing party, into a formal alliance with the far-right nationalist movement party, widely linked to the Grey Wolves and the old fascist paramilitary group. And then you see the increased levels of violence against LGBT people, refugees, the Armenian community, etc. Or turn to Brazil and you see just the far right in power in our lifetime. And we have to worry. Bolsonaro's government attacked trades unions, disbanded the country's Ministry of Labour within days of him taking office. So when you come across workers flirting with these far right things, We've got to say these people are attacking workers' rights. It's central to what they do. In March 2019, his administration ended automatic deduction of union subs with no warning. He's increasingly reliant on a core group of military-linked advisors, playing to the far-right gallery, even further right than himself, by attending anti-lockdown protests, speaking favorably about the military dictatorship, relaxing gun laws that led to a doubling of gun ownership in one year, Attacks and killings of indigenous leaders and trades unionists have also increased and impunity for the police. Racist police violence increasing in that country. And in Colombia, also in Latin America, one of the most dangerous places, as people on this call will know, to be a trades unionist. 14 assassinated in the past year alone. Two teacher uh, activists murdered last week, the week before. Under the far right president, Duque, authoritarian actions and right-wing rhetoric increasing all the time, a growing concentration of power in his hands during the pandemic. Key parts, like in Turkey, giving up the resolution process that in the 2016 peace agreement actively undermined with violence against activists, the ex-combatants and political opposition massively increasing. 260 social movement leaders, 240 former combatants murdered, in, the, uh, in, in just in the last couple of uh, months, really. And we see these examples in Europe, in Asia and Latin America, but it's truly a global phenomenon. And those countries, some of them have a reputation for being authoritarian in the past, or you can think about them that way, but it's really important to see the problem is not confined to countries that traditionally thought of as authoritarian, like the ones that, we've, that I've just spoken about. Since the onset of the war on terror in 2001, and especially since the 2008 financial crises, these practices have been strengthened by the mainstreaming of far-right ideas worldwide by governments that claim to be in the center ground. So in France, the state's brutal crackdown on protesters has come under criticism from the UN even for severe rights restrictions and excessive use of force. Macron has introduced policies by decree on 29 occasions, far-reaching labor and pension reforms that then faced widespread trades union opposition and continuing to drift to right to the right on questions of immigration and uh, the question of the Muslim population, including more intolerant steps just in the last week. And across the EU, we all have to see signs of member states converging on more restrictive migration policies. We have to think the deaths of hundreds of refugees at sea it leads to a coarsening of public discourse and it shows the tragic consequences of these policies. And in the US, as well as Europe, the past decade, two decades, marked by a continued expansion of executive powers, mass surveillance, arbitrary detention, torture of terror, terror suspects, and the Black Lives Matter movement brought to fore the systemic racism. Trump's term in office has been characterized by domestic uh, discriminatory policies and extreme rhetoric on Muslims, migrants, and Mexicans, serious implications for, for human rights, and mainstreaming these sorts of far-right narratives. And whilst we can all celebrate that Trump has been defeated electorally, he has also activated and transformed the US far right into something more coherent and more dangerous. He calls out directly to street movements like the Proud Boys. We have to worry about the future in the US as well as in Europe. Even in the UK, not even, in the UK, there are features of authoritarian neoliberalism, the extension of state powers, an increase in surveillance and the severity of police response to protest and dissent alongside the introduction of more exploitative working, exploitative working conditions and anti-union laws. All of this taking place in a climate of Islamophobia and a persistence of long-standing structural racism. The hostile environment measures 
will have been placed for a full decade by 2022, despite the outrage provoked by Windrush. Boris Johnson and his allies have emulated aspects of Trump's culture war and still are doing so, defending Britain's imperial history, stigmatizing Black Lives Matter protesters, prohibiting resources by anti-capitalist organizations in schools. No country can be compared directly in an exact parallel with another, but each of these countries is characterized by varying degrees of authoritarianism and right-wing rhetoric. And we know there are these links between these parties and movements of the far right in Europe and beyond. They may continue to grow and radicalize with the economic crisis we face, but we have to know that we can fight back. And there are lots of messages in this report about a fight back internationally as well. The rise of the far right we cannot afford to think is a foregone conclusion. And trades unions around the world have been instrumental in organizing to push back and to instead to form, to push for a transformative political vision. And it's crucial that as the crisis hits our members, we build strong global relationships and support unions facing repression elsewhere and learn from them. Internationalism and solidarity needs to be the foundation on which we build our work. And there are real examples in our country, like Steve, uh, Stefan talked about from Unite, the FBU, other unions, but in Germany, political education interventions now form a key part of trades union strategies to combat the far right. Italian unions and others across Europe working on tackling far right narratives in the workplace. The defeat of Donald Trump owed a great deal to the organizing and mobilizing efforts of trades unions and grassroots movement in the US. And there are huge examples of successful re resistance in Latin America, which do have lessons for all of us. So look at the victory in Bolivia, a far right led coup overturned by a huge electoral victory by the, by the mass and uh, demonstrating that a possibility of building a resilient movement from the bottom up where they concentrated on uh, movement building as opposed to just a narrow election focus, grassroots political education organized by the workers movement and campesino unions, an absolute foundation of the movement that won that election. And in Chile too, unions placed themselves at the heart of the movement to push back the right wing reaction and chart a new path. The referendum granted by the government to replace Pinochet's constitution came after years of campaigning and mass protest action involving trades unions, uh, students, school students, indigenous groups, the women's movements, real inspiration that you should take from those struggles. The histories and circumstances of these and other Latin American countries are very different to what we face, but they do highlight the necessity of industrial campaigning, extra parliamentary organizing, political education and movement building linked, like Steve, Stefan said, to a hopeful political vision. This is our fundamental uh, commitment to internationalism, to push back worldwide, to build a better narrative, to fight the far right everywhere they, they try and uh, get, their, get their, their roots in. This report's an important part of the fight back, but what we do about the report matters more than the report itself, obviously. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kevin. Um, you know, as I thought, both informing and uh, uh, stimulating, leading us to uh, think about what we can do. The questions are coming in thick and fast. Um, um, I'm going to introduce a video in just a minute, but some, um, uh, uh, some participants are asking, um, how can they access these presentations? Um, and when will the report be available? And did we know about the uh, International Anti-Racism Day taking place in March? So if perhaps some of those points could be addressed in the um, chat, uh, that would be really helpful. Um, so it's my pleasure now to um, screen a four minute video um, with messages from um, sister union activists in some of the countries Kevin's highlighted. Olá, é fato que vivemos uma conjuntura soturna no Brasil. As políticas públicas de combate à violência contra a mulher tiveram suas verbas zeradas pelo governo Bolsonaro. O desmonte dos serviços públicos atinge diretamente as populações negras, em especial as mulheres negras que estão em maior vulnerabilidade social que pese a população negra ser a maioria da população brasileira, também é a maioria dos pobres brasileiros. 
o discurso de ódio do governo Bolsonaro tem gerado uma onda de ataques aos espaços sagrados das religiões de matrizes africanas. E, para completar, as culturas periféricas geradas principalmente pela juventude negra têm sofrido cerceamento e têm sido criminalizada por este governo. Não basta somente desmontar as políticas públicas de inclusão social. Este governo também gera políticas de ataque àqueles mais vulnerabilizados na sociedade brasileira. Essa é a nossa realidade hoje. Desde a Colômbia, queremos manifestar a grande preocupação que temos frente à situação por que atravessamos os líderes e lideresas em Colômbia. Primero, desde la firma del acuerdo, van más de 1.050 líderes y lideresas asesinados, eh, 245 eh, firmantes de la paz asesinados, y en lo que va corrido del gobierno de Iván Duque, alrededor de eh, 450 líderes han sido eh, asesinados. Es alarmante porque estamos en un gobierno eh, autoritario, que miente a la comunidad internacional diciendo que implementa el acuerdo de paz y que genera las garantías, lo cual no es cierto. Estamos en un gobierno que es poco garantista, donde la vida y defender los derechos, eh, ejercer nuestro eh, rol como líderes y lideresas y defensores y defensoras de derechos humanos se ha convertido en un riesgo eh, vital. Our confederation is very active in relations to challenging uh extreme right or far rights and the messages we issue a lot of statements condemning the recent uh, lgbt free zones and uh, we support women's strikes and women in the fight for uh, reproduction rights we very recently condemned the decision of the polish government to block the eu budget on the grounds of the rule of law We work closely with community organizations, which also uh, are involved in tackling uh, far rights. We are participating in the European project in which with the trade unions from Western Europe, we try to find out how we could reach out to our members and to the workplaces to uh, combat far rights. And very recently, We also cooperate uh, very recently, we issued a statement, but we cooperate for a long time with the trade unions from countries which face the same challenges, such as Hungary, Slovakia, Czech Republic. And uh, we issue a, a statement on the rule of law. Turkey Kadın hareketini, avukatları, sendikacıları, siyasetçileri bir bütünen toplumsal muhalefeti olumsuz etkiliyor. Bizim sendikal faaliyetlerimiz, örgütlenme hakkımız, iş yeri gezilerimiz tutumsuz gibi gösterilerek ihraç ediliyoruz, tutuklanıyoruz, gözaltına alınıyoruz. İçlerinde benim de olduğum 4280 kez üyesi hala e, ihraç edilmekten kaynaklı mağduriyet yaşıyorlar. Yine bu baskıcı otoriter politikalar sonucunda gözaltına alınan ve tutuklanan 60 üyemiz hala cezaevinde tutuluyor. Tüm bu baskıcı politikalara karşı kez olarak sendikal mücadelemizi, demokrasi ve mücadelemizi kararlılıkla yürütmeye devam ediyoruz. Ve bunu yürütmeye de bundan sonra uluslararası bütün toplumla paylaşmaya ve dayanışmayla birlikte bu baskıcı politikalara karşı karanlıkla durmaya da devam edeceğiz. Yaşasın dayanışma, yaşasın kez, yaşasın örgüt mücadelemiz. That was uh, very, uh, very good and wonderful to hear from our friends. Um, and it really feels like they're with us uh, today uh, and on our journey. Um, so uh, we're going to move on now to our next speaker, um, Chidi King. Chidi's a great friend of ours. Um, she's the international TUC's uh, colleague who is the, you know, a director of equality and um, Obviously, that's a really important role. Uh, Chidi, we always love hearing from you. You are very welcome. 
Thank you very much, Gail and colleagues. It's a real pleasure to be with you here as um, the TC introduces this extremely important um, report um, for trade unions, not only in the UK, but um, worldwide on tackling um, the phenomenon that is um, the far right. Um, we are still talking about the rise of the far right. In many ways, the far right um, has risen. And um, we are, of course, all looking at um, what we need to do and what we need to do more of to counter um, the dominance in many parts of the world of far right um, ideology, far right thinking, um, far right media, far right political parties, and even the infiltration of the far right into um, what we might term social um, movements. And as trade unions, I think we are ideally poised um, to do just that. And I think the report sets out um, very clearly some of the urgent steps um, we all need to be taking um, to achieve um, this common goal. I think from the ITUC's perspective, um, of course, we've, we would focus on the international um, aspect um, of this. And the report, as, uh, as did previous speakers, um, clearly underlines that um, the, the far right or the rise of the far right is a global phenomenon and needs to be tackled through international solidarity. It can't only be tackled um, at national level. And indeed, it's interesting to see that one of the main um, mechanisms, just as it, it reaches across borders or its, its reach has um, extended um, across borders using, um, as previous speakers, and the report clearly outlines um, online platforms um, and indeed mainstream media um, as well. So the far right also seeks to um, assert the primacy of the nation state over international rule of law. We saw this um, with the Trump administration and his attacks on multilateralism. We're seeing it play out at the heart of Europe um, right now with um, Holland, Hungary and others um, rejecting the EU budget on the basis of um, the proposed conditionality that all EU member states should observe um, the rule of law. And this is something that's particularly crucial for us as trade unions, because indeed it's what's been used um, to attack trade union rights um, across the world. Um, nation states asserting their rights to clamp down on any opposition, using the full weight of state machinery as well to clamp down on any opposing voices, criminalizing social movements, criminalizing trade union actions, even criminalizing peaceful assistance um, to communities in distress. And we've seen that in Europe as well with attempts to criminalize um, actions to bring assistance to migrant workers and asylum um, seekers um, who are in distress, um, for example. And we see also how the use of language, and I think this is something that as trade unions, um, we also need to pay particular attention to or to be vigilant about. Um, the use of language really to deny people um, their rights, but also to co-opt people into giving up um, their rights. Um, um, brings to mind a quote from Paulo Freire, um, the oppressed having internalized the image of the oppressor and adopted his guidelines are fearful of freedom. And we see this constantly play out as well in mainstream uh, media. We see it in the rejection um, by many sections of populations across the, the world of um, the terminology around protection of human rights, advancement of human rights, which people tend to see now through the othering, if you like, um, of others as something that impinges on their freedoms. So we have this relativizing, if you, if you will, of human rights, securing the human rights of migrant workers, for example, is portrayed as giving up the human rights of um, the, the national population. Um, we see, if I look at um, what's happening in the UK as well, the term activist lawyers now being used to bring forward attacks against the role of the judiciary um, and the role that it can play in securing the human rights of, of a population. So as the report says, and as other speakers have said, the role of education for us um, is crucial. Um, the role of monitoring for us as trade unions, 
as well is crucial, but monitoring so that we can share, um, again, across borders, examples of the tactics and the tools that um, far-right um, organizations, far-right political parties and far-right governments are using um, to oppress. Um, I think in, in closing, I would say again that the importance of building alliances with other progressive um, movements here is key. At the ITC, for example, we're working very closely with the International Peace Bureau and particularly the youth wing of the International Peace Bureau um, to ensure that we are building this um, broad um, alliance um, across movements, but educating a younger generation um, and educating them so that they can stand up for their rights, so that they understand what underlies um, the prevailing um, far-right ideologies, so that they understand the political forces behind um, the far-right ideologies and the necessity of denying them um, their freedoms and their rights that these ideologies, political parties, movements um, rely on. Um, I think uh, probably coming up, giving looking at um, the opportunity to give time to answer questions from, from the floor. I think I'm probably coming up to the end of my speaking time, but I, in closing again, I would just thank the IT, the TUC rather, for the phenomenal report. But as others have said, now that we have the report, the challenge for us is to use it, to use it to fight back against the rise of the far right. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Chidi, and I can think of no better link to our next speaker uh, than using the report to fight back than to our TUC General Secretary, Frances O'Grady, uh, because she is, if nothing else, um, and she's many things, a woman of action. So uh, uh, over to you, Frances. Thanks very much, Gail, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, on what I think is one of the most important strategic challenges that we face. Uh, thanks to all our speakers and thanks uh, to Mariella, Tanya, Sue, Will, um, the whole TUC team who are working so hard on this. And of course, thanks to Stevie uh, and Trademark for a brilliant report. Um, Earlier, Kevin spoke about uh, the presidential elections in um, the United States and Gail and I were both on a, a seminar with the our sister organization, the AFL-CIO. And I think we both agree that one of the most moving parts was when we heard how when the far right were intimidating people at polling stations, how the uh, AFL-CIO put out a call to unions and trade unionists went down to the polling stations and defended working people exercising their right to vote. And I found that really moving because ultimately to me, this is about democracy and about the trade union historic fight for democracy and those who oppose us. And democracy for, for us, of course, is not just political, it's economic too. And defending working people's right to a voice, I think, is at the heart of our opposition uh, to the far right. Uh, we do have that incredibly proud record of taking on the far right. Uh, you know, you look back through the 20th century from Cable Street to the anti-apartheid struggle to uh, marching on the streets. But I think we do need to recognise that we're dealing with a different beast. Many of the features like anti-Semitism uh, and racism are familiar, uh, but there are more uh, subtleties, I think, to this new 21st century beast that we need to acknowledge, whether that's uh, not just um, uh, racial supremacism or national supremacism, but gender supremacism too. Uh, you know, we've seen that in the uh, uh, far right uh, money behind some of the anti-abortion uh, struggles. And of course, we've seen in particular how Muslims are targeted in terms of the racism uh, that's expressed. So for me, there are, you know, some big differences. There is a big global money behind this new networked far right. Uh, there is a big online presence 
and uh, we know that online is fertile territory uh, for um, conspiracy theories, uh, for uh, analysing who is more su susceptible uh, to those sorts of messages and being able to target them. And, uh, you know, people will be familiar with my self-criticism of the movement that we have underinvested in online uh, comms and mobilisation, although we have seen since the pandemic a big shift uh, towards digital trade unionism, not as a substitute for face-to-face, -face, but my goodness me, do we need to invest big time to be able to even match, never mind surpass, uh, the reach of some of these uh, ugly organisations. And thirdly, of course, that spread to the mainstream. And I probably need to say no more than look at the spectacle of the photo opportunities uh, we see emanating from the Home Office in respect of asylum seekers, uh, the boat people, what the emotions that that is meant to trigger uh, that sense of defending our borders, uh, criminalising vulnerable people, and so on. Uh, so I think we know how far this has really spread into the mainstream. I think it's also worth drawing on Steve's report um, to think about what, what's the unique value, what's the added value that the trade union movement offers in a way that nobody else can, because we've got to be pretty hard-headed about where our priorities lie and where we can make the most difference. And there are just some reflections from me, Gail. I would say uh, we sometimes underestimate the importance of our convening power, the fact that we can get people into a room, the same room, in a way that nobody else can, whether that's locally, nationally or globally. Um, and that, I think, is critical because if there's one thing that we've learned from our history, it's the importance of a broad front response, it's the importance of unity over division, and that requires a way of working, uh, negotiating skills, that willingness uh, to find a way through and find that common cause, which is, to me, at the heart of trade unionism. Um, it's also, by the way, I think about empowering those who are targeted within our own ranks. We all know we've got a long way to go before the leadership of the trade union movement at every level looks like uh, the new diverse working class that we represent. And uh, this, is, this is real stuff because if we are to be a true ally, if we are to create a safe space for people to fight back, then we have got to get our own act together in terms of looking like the people we aim to represent. There's been some lovely poetry uh, and lovely quotes used by other speakers. Uh, mine would be James Connolly, none so fit to break their chains than those who wear them. So, you know, we need to do more within our own movement, I think, to empower people. Um, and we also need to recognise that our power is rooted in the workplace. Uh, there is some fantastic reps education online, easily accessible, um, that the TUC and many of our unions have produced. But if you haven't already, and if it's not in the chat box, then look at uh, tackling the far right on the TUC website loads of resources and online training, including special modules, but critically, how to have those one-to-one -one conversations in the workplace. Many of our reps we know need more confidence to push back against the spread of those ideas, but to do it in a way that's productive, not just finger wagging, which we know doesn't work, but actually listening and then persuading and peeling away that layer of workers who might otherwise be attracted um, to the far right and indeed increasingly the radical right. Um, we've also got some fantastic initiatives, um, cross-border initiatives, for example, the TUC and UNITE working together with our German friends, the DGB and IG Mattel, um, to look at how we can work in multinational corporations to create workplaces that can become far right free zones with a bastion of organized workers who
who are prepared to take on and combat those ideas. And of course, trade unionism doesn't stop at the workplace door. We know that. Uh, we also have an obligation to our communities, including defence of our communities, but also winning hearts and minds. And that is, again, I think, where we need to be hard headed and learn about what works and what doesn't. So, you know, at a very simple level, and we've tested this time and time again, we know that myth busting doesn't work, uh, reeling off facts and figures doesn't work, but very often simple, plain language that is inclusive to people. That's about no matter what race or religion or background you come from, everybody should have decent work. Everybody should be treated with dignity at work. The, these are the sorts of messages we know can attract people and bring people back. Um, of course, we have to tackle the root causes. And we, we know that, don't we? We know uh, what creates fertile ground for uh, fascism and racism and radical right ideas to grow. Um, inequality, austerity, we've seen it all. Um, we know that perhaps the biggest threat we face, and it's one of the reasons why we fought so hard for wage subsidy schemes, is mass unemployment, because uh, that is the way that we saw this in the 1980s, how people are divided, um, how they become scared, how they become uh, obsessed with looking after their own families rather than looking after neighbours and workmates too. So we have to uh, tackle the root causes. But I also want us to take on building pride in our own class and culture and identity, that we are the new working class. We are black and white. We are all faiths and none. We are women as well as men. And we need to uh, be positive, optimistic and ambitious and can do in the way that we build that sense of identity and pride in who we are um, with working people as a whole. So I would just say, Gail, I think this is a great opportunity to share ideas, to strategize, but critically to come up with practical uh, plans with clear objectives, clear priorities that work to our strengths, tackle our weaknesses. Um, but that ultimately, for me, this, this is about working people joining together, pushing back, using every tool in the box, every 21st century tool in the box to show that we, our values of decency and dignity, equality and justice for working people will win through. Thank you, Gail. Thank you very much indeed, Francis. And in many respects, you've actually touched on a lot of the points that have been brought through uh, in the questions. Um, so I'm expecting that we're going to have our whole panel up soon. Um, and uh, I'm going to feed the questions into the panel. So um, there have been a lot of questions. So I'm don't want to be disrespectful to the people that have asked them, but I may group them or just cut them down a bit. Um, and the first person uh, to put their uh, toe in the water um, was Robert, who, who questioned really um, government. Uh, do we believe that our current government is encouraging racism? Um, and he pointed uh, specifically uh, to Gavin Williamson uh, and what he described as his jingoistic outburst against all our EU colleagues. And Stephen, um, in another uh, question, um, says that he recognises the old beast of nationalism raising its ugly head. Um, so um, I wonder who would, who in our panel would like to come back on, on, on those? If you can just put your hands up because we can't have everybody, we won't get through the questions. Um, Kevin? You've been volunteered, so unmute yourself. <laughs> Gail, I didn't put my hand up, but thank you very much for calling me in. Uh, I, I thought that Gavin Williamson made a fool of himself yesterday. I, I think he was reaching for jingoism, but I think he failed to get there. You know, it just was a, a joke that uh, 
he made a joke of himself. But I do, but that is not to um, negate the fact that he was trying to reach for something. And I, I don't think that you can look at what this government has done around the hostile environment and are, uh, then leading to the Windrush thing and think that isn't intended to play into racism as a way of mobilizing support for a political party and for, for you know, when they're, when they're in some difficulty. So I think it's true that they are flirting with, uh, encouraging racism and that, that every time that happens, that mainstreams far right narratives that bit more. And you don't just see it here, you do see it when Donald Trump talks about Mexicans, migrants, Muslims, you know, those, those um, you see it in France, the way Macron I think is talking about uh, Muslims and stoking Islamophobia. So I think it's true that our government and our governments are encouraging this sort of behavior. How conscious that is, is for other people to talk about. But sometimes I think some of them, for some of them, for Trump, it's very conscious that he's doing that and stoking division deliberately. Thanks very much, um, Kevin. Um, by the way, um, some of the questions Ken, for example, has asked, um, are we going to follow up with training? And just to say what I said earlier, keep an eye on the chat because future training courses um, are going to be highlighted there. Um, I wonder, Stefan, can I ask you to come in on... Um, some very strong points that have been made, um, Claire and Anne and others, about intersectionality. Um, misogyny uh, uh, uh, is a hate crime. Um, and uh, Anne said, ask, could we signpost her to sections that discuss um, the threat of the far right to disabled people, quite uh, rightly pointing um, to the uh, eugenicists, and in particular, um, the, uh, the, the use of eugenics uh, by the Nazi regime. Um, is there something you'd like to uh, say about intersectionality? Yeah, well, the report makes reference, of course, to various kind of groups um, that the far right targets. Um, each of those, of course, is a separate report in and of itself, because the, the scope is so wide, there's no one that these groups won't target. Um, and of course, one of the key dynamics of modern the modern far right is misogyny. Actually, it's that kind of anti-feminist approach to you, you see it. If you take, for example, Vox in Spain, it's it's one of their kind of main priorities to attack the modern feminist women, attack, attack women. So now, of course, each far right party, each far right grouping has a different particular target from time to time because there's a global phenomenon. Of course, they all kind of pick their their own targets. Um, but I think it's really really important that L, that LGBTQ plus the trans community, women, they're particular targets that haven't really been a target of the far right necessary in the past when it was clearly about racial superiority. So it's a <laughs> there's, there's no one they can't hate. That, I think that's the message here. Um, but each far right group, each far right political party chooses their own. The, the, one, the one part that's not in the report potentially is I suppose um, issues around disability and eugenics. That hasn't, and that isn't really part of the modern far right. Absolutely, it's been part of the history of fascism and Nazism in the past. It hasn't manifested itself in the ways in which it has done in the past. That's not to say it isn't there, and that's not to say that other groups won't do that yet. Because as, as Kevin said, this is still a grow. Oh, sorry, Chidi said this. This is a. This isn't a growing phenomenon. It is a phenomenon. It's here, uh, and it continues to grow. Thanks, Stefan. Um, Lester, uh, this is to you, Francis. Um, Lester. Uh, talks about um, deracializing whiteness um, and turns to the terminology multicultural working class. Um, uh, I remember some time ago you expressing very strong views about the terminology, the white working class. I wonder if you'd like to respond to that. Well, I have to say when this first kicked off a few years back and you had, um, you know, people writing books about the white working class. I remember feeling genuinely perplexed. Why, why was there no discussion of the black working class? Or uh, why wasn't there a study about the white upper class? You know, it, it just, it's sort of, um, I suppose I smelt a rat to tell you the truth. It sort of felt like, here we go again. Uh, somebody trying to divide people against each other. And it wasn't, um, I don't think that is the experience that many of us 
the lived experience, as they like to say, that many of us have in the trade union movement, where we know the importance of um, uh, unity, because as, as we used to say in the organising academy, there's no such thing as an unorganised workplace, it's just the boss got there first. And so you would still have primarily black people on the night shift, white people on the day shift, black people not compensated even for those uh, unsocial hours. You know, we knew women uh, obviously underpaid. We knew the ways that uh, our opponents, if you like, would try and divide us up. And the point of trade unionism is to stop that competition between workers and recognize that we have a common interest as one class. So, um, yeah, I, I, I am extremely suspicious of this. And of course, uh, we have recently intervened in terms of some of the appointments to the uh, commission, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, where uh, it seems extraordinary to me uh, that a new member of that commission can be talking about, uh, uh, talking about whiteness and not necessarily being uh, a white identity, not necessarily being a problem, excuse me. You know, it's um, so very, again, that worrying creeping into the mainstream of ideas that in crude terms are about dividing working people against each other. But having said that, I want us to challenge ourselves because to pretend that we've got our own house in order would be wrong. Uh, we know that there is plenty of work that we have to do within the trade union movement amongst our own members in terms of education and in terms of our values. And also we've got to get our own house in order. And that's why I'm delighted that Leicester uh, is uh, dedicated to supporting our new task group on anti-racism, uh, which is designed to both get our own house in order and also to make a difference in workplaces in particular in tackling racism uh, and all forms of uh, discrimination there. Thanks very much Francis and I was hoping it was the same Leicester so um, uh, <laughs> I'm assuming it is maybe I, I, I hope so. Um, so Chidi, um, Chidi you talked about very eloquently about the use of language um, and um, another Robert, Robert M, um, put a very thoughtful uh, question forward. I can't read it all out, it's a bit long, but he's, he's saying, well, look, where's the line between legitimizing far-right ideology but allowing um, free exchange of ideas? And he kind of, you know, he sort of posed in the UK the so-called Tommy Robinson Football Lads Alliance thing, um, with Nigel Farage, who, of course, um, uh, in the UK had a broadcasting slot. Um, so, so Chidi, you know, any gut, any ideas about, you know, what's in and out and how, how, how we can help people with that? Thank you, Gail. Thanks for the very tough question, <laughs> that's all I have to say. Um, my reflection on this would be, Look, freedom of expression is something that we all need to hold on to as being a key value of our societies. It's crucial to, it's part of what's on the attack when it comes to trade union rights as well. Our right to freedom of expression, our right to freedom of assembly. So that's a fundamental value that we all need to protect. The other thing that I would say in relation to that though is that um, we have to look at how that is misused in order to allow voice to organizations, to um, groupings that are designed to fundamentally attack those values that we're all clinging on to. We have to look at the way um, the mainstream media, for instance, gives particular space to some of these groupings. If we look at the lead up, I mean, I don't have figures to hand, but if we look at the lead up to Brexit, the amount of space and time that was given to Nigel Farage for instance, in the Brexit party compared to the amount of space and time that was given to others that wanted to make a case for the European approach, for a case for staying within Europe was hugely disproportionate. And I think that that's something um, that we need to be alive to and something that needs to be tackled. How we tackle it, that's the um, $60 million question, if you like. It's not by attacking um, the media, because again, that's you know a fundamental um, 
value that we need to cling on to. It's part of um, the freedoms or the vehicle for the freedoms that we want to secure, but challenging the media, certainly. Um, we don't have to go out on all, all fronts attack on it, but we have to challenge um, the media where we see this bias appearing. We also have to, and I think others have said, challenge um, these notions when they creep up um, within our own movement, whether it's within our workplaces or whether it's within the trade union movement um, itself. I think back to, and I think the report actually speaks to this when it talks about you know, trade unions perhaps having in place um, rules um, that ensure that um, we don't propagate um, these ideologies um, within our own organizations. If I think back maybe, what was it, 12, 13 years ago to the Azalev case, for instance, um, which had to go all the way up to the European Court of Human Rights in order to enable Azalev to expel a member of what was then um, the BNP. I mean, I think this is, this is crucial. Um, and us being um, on the while us being vigilant, let's put it that way, um, to this within our own organizations, I think is a, is a crucial part of that. Yes, let's have discussions, but we have to be careful that those discussions don't indeed um, give succor um, to those who want to um, use notions of freedom of expression or fundamental values such as freedom of expression um, to propagate um, hatred and hate speech. Thanks. For can, I just add, can I just add, Gail? Yes, you know, I, I think a lot of the questions and including those about the government, we do we do have to look at this through the lens of those former red wall seats and who the government thinks it's appealing to and what will appeal to them. And the truth is they have attacked many of our institutions, including trade unions over many years. And that, you know, for, for people in my family and I'm sure other people's too, Actually, becoming a rep in the trade union movement was always a source of pride. It was a way of being able to exercise leadership, to be respected, to speak up for fellow workers. And a lot of people, particularly in the private sector, have lost that. And I think what the far right are trying to do and some of their allies in the mainstream is appeal to an emotional sense of being scared, humiliated, feeling robbed of respect and as well as all the material stuff that we know about and uh, you know I mean, this may sound um, a bit obvious but I do th genuinely believe that one of the best ways that we can win people back is through organizing and giving people the opportunity to show their leadership uh, according to our values because that's about it is about dignity a lot of this and we're trying to counter organizations that offer people a voice and and a role who feel they've been looked down on and humiliated for too long and so we've got to we've got to create an alternative sense of identity and pride and opportunities no matter what what age you left school that you can show you've got leadership capacity to you are a leader and you get respect through the trade union movement and what you do for fellow workers. Thanks so much, uh, Francis. I'm, I, I'm really keen to, to put a few points to Stefan, if I may. Um, Stefan, and it, it fits in really, uh, loads of people, um, Ben and others have said, um, don't we urgently need to tackle and create an alternative the far right online ecosystem. Um, and, and that point um, keeps coming up uh, by, by, by participants. Um, I'd like you to, to think about that. Um, and whilst I've got you, can I chuck in another one? Um, Max has asked, um, does the report identify um, the growth of anti-Semitism as being used by the far right? So. Can I ask you to look at those two issues, please? Because we're running out of time. Yeah, yeah, the second one first. It does we do mention anti-Semitism as part of the again, a part of the characteristics of the far right. Again, depending on which particular tradition that far right comes from. Obviously, Central Europe, um, Austria, Germany, it's it's kind of central to their value system and they promote it and they uh, a lot. 
but we don't go into any depth, of course, because as we said before, we mentioned them all, but each one deserves really its own report because each one is a particular a subject for discussion. But yeah, absolutely, it's in and absolutely, we've witnessed a massive spike in anti-Semitism over the last 10 or 15 years um, that we've all witnessed and we're all very aware of. <laughs> and in terms of the, the ecosystem stuff, I think Francis mentioned that there's a there's a, it's kind of come up, it's kind of snuck up on us, really, I think. I think, we've, you know, they've been working on, on this stuff for 10 years. They've, as I said in the, in the report, they're very sophisticated. They're very disciplined. I'll give an example from the elections last year in Germany and Austria. Um, the hashtag AFD was on top of Twitter for a week before the election because there were thousands of far right people when following quite good instructions from where, from the networks they belong to that were promoting and pushing those ideas on uh, through social media we have nothing similar to the level of sophistication they do on the left that's just a fact so yes Gail there's a huge and sorry whoever the question was there's a huge body piece of work there to do who does it how we do it I think we have to have a real good discussion about that because I think um it doesn't replace, as Francis said, what we do in face to face and what we do on the streets and what we do in demonstrations. But it's a it's a kind of tool in our arsenal that simply isn't really there at the moment. And I'd argue that they're years ahead of us on that point. Yes, and and I just took a look at uh, Twitter, um, and we can always improve how we um, channel these types of events through uh, social media. Uh, the team's doing brilliantly, and um, we we just probably need to do more now, Kevin. Um, I'm going to put a, um, a bunch of questions to you uh, in the hope that you can skillfully join them together in the remaining two minutes. So, um, so the first is, do you, and this is tailor-made for you, um, do you think schools have a place in educating um, the future generations uh, uh, about awareness on racism and anti-racism? Um, and has it occurred to any of us to link up with the Students' Union in this important work of combating the far right? Um, and will the TUC help us do better? And can we please include the Trades Councils? That's from Peter. It was Mark that came in on schools. And then finally, um, Spiros, uh, and I'm going to guess that's uh, Spiros with a Greek heritage, and draws attention to the Golden Dawn, um, but the system of capitalism um, being a breeding ground really for far right uh, ideology. And Maria, also from Chile, um, talked about um, how they mobilized, um, vocalizing the injustice of their economic system. Um, so um, so uh, over to you, Kevin, in two minutes, one minute. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Gail. I, schools should be playing a central part, and many trades unions support Show Racism the Red Card, which does some really good work, often talking to kids who have quite hardened racist ideas and changing their mind, and also talking with kids in schools who are really anti-racist. And, and so there is a really important role, but we have to fight partly for some space to change the curriculum. Teachers would like to what we call decolonize the curriculum, but the government doesn't want us to do that. So there's a big battle with the government about who, who controls the curriculum, but schools should be a central part of making a community where love is the dominant emotion rather than here, fear and hatred. So absolutely. And the t can the TUC help us do better? I think that the TUC is helping us do better by hosting this today. You know, uh, we all have, the TUC doesn't have a magic wand. Uh, the TUC is, convening it's, it's francis's convening power convening all of us to try and do our bit and take the thing forward and I, I, if i'll say one thing about golden dawn there is a real message of hope in golden dawn being defeated their, their central leaders being jailed and don't for a second just believe that was the working through of just a legal process in greece that was the result of our comrades in greece trades unions in greece mobilizing against Golden Dawn. It was the result of activist lawyers taking cases against Golden Dawn. It's our movement that's defeated Golden Dawn in Greece. And so there's a message of hope in that, I think, for all of us. Thank you so much, Kevin. And actually, uh, a message of hope. Um, I think that's a really fitting ending to this. I just want the panelists to know 
um, that uh, there's lots of very uh, warm and complimentary comments uh, about your contributions uh, and this webinar. Um, it would not have been possible to have put Stefan's report together had we not had solidarity uh, of our sister unions globally. And I've been asked to make a special thanks, uh, thank you uh, to our global uh, sisters and brothers. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard to summarize this, except I think um, there's a real appetite from the questions and from what the panelists have said um, to get on with the job, uh, to move into the new year feeling confident um, that we've got a plan, that we're backing that plan up with education, uh, trade union education, look in the chat, uh, reminded not just of education on um, combating the far right in new education uh, uh, uh, opportunities, but the existing combating anti-Semitism, which is a toolkit well worth uh, using. So um, it's just uh, looking forward to reinvigorating this work and continuing it in the new year, thanking all of the panelists, all of the uh, fantastic TUC staff that makes this possible and the uh, hundreds of participants. Um, thank you, everybody. And goodbye. <laughs> well done.